The subject of today's lecture is the, uh, some works of Michael Snow, uh, the Torontonian artist. And uh, I will start by maybe reminding some of you that uh, at Expo 67, uh, there was an Ontario pavilion in which you were received by 11 figure of stainless steel, uh, rather thin, about human size, I would say, like five feet something. They were distributed a little bit everywhere in the pavilion. Maybe this is asking too much uh, from the memory of my younger uh, public here, but you should know that there was an exhibition. <laughs> there was an Expo 67. Uh, was called Man and His World, and there there was many pavilions, and one of them was the Pavilion of Ontario. And uh, here, what you see, of course, it's uh, it's the uh, the series of the sculpture was called Walking Woman. Um, I would say in a kind of storehouse, because in the pavilion it, them itself, they were distributed strategically here and there, and they they were not just a pile like this. There is. Uh, some of them were, let's say, like in cutouts like this, as if you, you had just the, uh, the rectangular sheet of steel from which was taken uh, the shape that you have in the others. And uh, uh, Snow called them negative figure. Uh, uh, there was also, let's say, at a certain point, like if you had two of them crossing each other, uh, what you see on the left there, and uh, the two figures, instead of being, uh, let's say, one above the other, they were really in the same plane and creating a kind of um, strange space between their neck here, who looks a little bit like a shield. Uh, so they were there. The other painting was there is also snow. It's called Clothed Woman, but I, I will speak of it uh, later. Uh, for the moment, I just want to sh give you an idea of this series of, of sculpture. Uh, this one was called Corner. Uh, figure, and uh, indeed it's like if two of these walking women were meeting at a corner of a building, of a corner of a street, if you want, uh, going in high speed in each direction, and <laughs> just before they hit, they are they're solidified in, uh, again in this uh, steel. Uh, there was a few, uh, few others, like a kind of stretch one, it was a huge uh, uh, piece of, of sculpture in which you see the same figure, but like if it was stretched, you see, but I don't have a slide of this, but anyway. Uh, this series have occupied snow for um, all the 60s, I would say, and it is also a time when he was living in New York with Joyce Whelan, uh, his wife of those days, who, as you know, is also a considerable artist. Uh, so he was in New York, and uh, he have said that Toronto was not a, a milieu in which you see you could really find yourself and, and like many artists, many Canadian artists thought New York is the place to go. And indeed, as uh, critic uh, uh, Michael Fulford, uh, Robert Fulford have said, it, it is maybe in New York he was not known like in Canada. Uh, so he, was, he had less the pressure of repeating himself. Up to then, he was known as a kind of uh, ex abstract expressionist, I would say. Uh, the painting of snow before the, the walking woman was uh, in the trend, let's say, of American painting in general. And he had success in Canada during this period. 1962-65, he exhibited in Toronto, he exhibited in Vancouver. Uh, he, it, he, he, it was not completely empty. But in New York, of course, he was much less known. Uh, and because of that, maybe he could expand, uh, find new ideas without the pressure of just answering, uh, let's say, what people expect from him. Uh, uh, like many artists also that went to New York, many Canadian artists who went to New York, they start with already kind of, I would say, positive prejudice toward American art. Uh, especially all the, the great uh, abstract expressionists like Pollock, uh, uh, Rothko, Newman, and De Kooning. Uh, and De Kooning is, is, is important here because, as you know, in 1950s, he did a series of, uh, uh, of painting that he called also women. Yeah. So if we want to speak of the walking woman of snow, I think it's important also that we have this kind of icon, I would say, if I can call this that way, because it's really aggressively ugly. Uh, the, uh, 
uh, this icon in mind uh, in 1950. Uh, and uh, this is woman one, but there is a series of them, and this is, let's say, uh, one example of this. Uh, uh, so uh, as I told you, uh, uh, Snow was, uh, was uh, interested in that painting, and he even says uh, very clearly that he felt influenced by the Koenig also. Uh, for instance, uh, in a text that calls uh, Near Misses, near, uh, near Misses uh, he says, influence and thank you. Uh, as a, it's written telegraphically, if you want. It's not really phrases, but it gives just short notes of what he thinks. Influence and thank you. And the people he wants to thank are Duchamp, Matisse, De Koenig, Mondrian. And he had also something which, uh, we will go back to when he says, echoing of artists working in happenings and environment, the ideas having never seen same, uh, meaning that uh, he heard about happening and environment in New York at the time, but not having seen them, it was m more an idea than something else. But he says, even the idea had an influence on me. Yeah. So here, in fact, he is, he's, telling two, he's telling two things. First, there was a kind of an influence of the Koenig in particular, and secondly, there was an influence also of these happening and environment that uh, New York artists were starting to do. Uh, the, the influence of the Koenig could be uh, maybe illustrated by a quote by one of his friends, was well, Graham Cautry. Um, Cautry did uh, exactly like Snow in terms of his forma formation. They were both at the Ontario College of Art and they exhibited together. Their first exhibition was a duo show, if you want, at Hart House, where it's very classical, let's say, to start a good career in Toronto by Hart House. And uh, both of them knew each other well, and Cautry uh, spoke about uh, this uh, series of uh, painting by de Koenig in that way. I just quote wh what he says. He says, the thing about de Koenig that has always been important to me, and in a way it's important also to Snow, is the way he turned the image into an actual way of painting, spread it all over the canvas, and still retain traces of what the image was to begin with. It's a marvelous combination of seeing and then having an emotional response that is translated into a way of painting. What do you want to say, I think, if I, if I interpret this correctly? It is as if here, the subject matter, meaning this kind of vociferous, virago, terrible uh, uh, image of a woman, was suggesting a way to paint. Huh? like the fact that it seems to have been slashed all over the, the, the surface there with drippings and with a lot of, uh, uh, as if he had almost difficulty to contain the image in the surface on which he works. Uh, so th that's what Cartier suggested. He says, what is fantastic here, it is that the subject matter suggests a way to paint. Uh, there's a kind of connection. And nevertheless, we don't lose completely the image. What de Kooning had to say about this series of his work was a little bit different. He says, painting the woman is a thing in art that has been done over and over. The idol, Venus, the nude, etc., etc. Uh, really think it's a sort of, of silly to do it. Uh, but the moment you take this attitude, it's just as silly not to do it. Uh, okay, this is the Kooning comment. What he means by it's silly to do it, it is when you realize that there's a kind of silliness in this idea of painting a woman, let's say, in, in that manner, it is that you have already take position on certain ideas. For instance, the idea that uh, the human body is the perfect uh, uh, proportion, is an harmonious thing, it's the, a sign of beauty. Uh, obviously, this is not the choice of the Koenig. The second thing is that uh, the, uh, I would say this kind of male chauvinist idea that uh, women have to be beautiful but, but uh, quiet. Uh, in, in French it says, sois belle et tais-toi. Uh, <laughs> the third uh, idea I would say also that you find silly and, and that you want to not to express there, it is the voyeuristic idea that woman is object of contemplation and have no subjectivity whatsoever. If you want to, to see what de Koenig was thinking of this idea, you just look at his painting. First of all, uh, all the prettiness, let's say, associated with women is excluded here. Uh, the silence also, I will not dare 
to, <laughs> to uh, try to make this woman stop the sp speaking if she decides uh, to do it. De Koning says that she seems to be hissing between her teeth and she seems very vociferous and dangerous. So it's not the person that you could say, tais-toi, uh, sois belle et tais-toi. Huh? And finally, this kind of objective point of view, I don't think you have it either, uh, this thing here, since she's, she's really like, a, she looks like a janitor or something like that. She's very identified in a way. And uh, you, you remember this, this word also of Cézanne speaking to his wife, and I think I've quoted it already, ne bougez pas plus qu'une pomme, uh, don't move more than an apple. Uh, if there was one painter who see the woman as an object, it was Cézanne. Uh, and here in the country, you could say you have an individual. You have this kind of uh, emotional response to some uh, to uh, a real experience. And uh, this this is let's say the point of view uh, of of De Kooning on this on this painting. But also he had after uh, things that is close to what Cartier was was saying. He says it becomes a problem of picture painting because the very fact that it had words connected with it. Uh, figure of a woman, made, make it more precise, form ought to have the motion of a concrete experience, meaning that you cannot have just a formal approach to this type of picture. There is a subject matter there. Because of the words, because it's entitled woman and not composition or, or abstract number two or something like that. Uh, because there is uh, a figure there you and, and words associated to it, you have, uh, you make, reference to a certain network of experience and then of emotion too because these experiences could be reminiscent of certain emotion that you had and, and then you, you include that in the picture. Cautry uh, himself uh, integrated in his own work uh, something of that. You see, I, I, I show you a drawing and a painting by Graham Cautry, myth one on the left and uh, one of the Ibiza drawing, it's a series of drawings. He used to proceed the, the, uh, this way. He started from still, from film. You know what it is, it's kind of photo that are taken from film. And then from there make drawings and it had many of them. This is what you see on the right. And finally transpose that on a canvas. And habitually you have a human form there. So in Cautry, he is also like, uh, I would say, uh, De Kooning also not uh, excluding the, the figuration of, uh, of a human being or of, a, of an image. But it is as if the image was peering from the, the background of the picture. So all the accumulation of matter that you have on it finally make it appear as if it was coming from the background toward us uh, in, the, uh, in the space uh, of the Honlooker. Uh, the, the, the very idea that you have there is also an idea that was already defended both by uh, the, the early critics of the abstract expressionists and also by Snow. Snow says, he says, the revelation of a process, a subject in Pollock, de Koenig, continues. Uh, revelation revelation of, a of a process as subject, uh, meaning that the painting gives you something of its genesis. Uh, you see in a painting not only a finished product, but also the, the process was behind. There's enough left in the painting to understand how it was done. Uh, uh, this is a little bit what Harry Rosenberg used to say about the, the, the whole group of the action painters. He says, at a certain moment, the canvas began to appear to one American painter after another as an arena in which to hack rather than as a space in which to reproduce, redesign, analyze, or express an object. Uh, what was to go on the canvas was not a picture, but an event. Uh, so this is the very idea, of course, of action painting, meaning the process is more important than the result, and you should also feel in the very painting the way the process, uh, uh, the way the painting was done, uh, as if the painting kept some of his, uh, some marks or some clues, let's say, of its own genesis, of its own uh, progress. Uh, and, uh, okay, so that's certainly uh, ideas that were in the air, let's say, at the time, and that have touched also certainly snow, and in which uh, you could say the choice, the very choice of uh, making walking woman for about 10 years of his life, this is, was a constant theme that he, he did and he redo and all that, could come from uh, partly for, from this uh, surrounding. 
The other thing also it is that there were many Torontonian or let's say Ontarian artists who were interested by the female form at the time. So, for instance, you could say Cautry, okay, that we just saw, but also Greg Kernow. Uh, Kernow uh, uh, entitled this painting is a feeding per se. It's a part, it's a, he made a whole series uh, about, his, he called them his family pictures, uh, meaning uh, uh, inspired by his own family, by the, the, the birth of his son, and, and, and then the first years and all that. Kernow was a good uh, uh, husband and an and <laughs> and extraordinary painter also, and he had this this generosity of making suddenly a series of, of things. Another uh, painter of Toronto at the time who was dealing with the same type of subject matter also is Dennis Burton. Uh, it, uh, this one is called Listening to the Stones, but uh, the stone, of course, with a capital S. Uh, it's not, <laughs> they are not listening to the stone, they are listening to the rock group who is called that way. Uh, again, this kind of, uh, uh, if you want a little bit influenced by pop art uh, type of uh, uh, depiction. So there was definitively in the air this team uh, among Torontonian artists, and they were uh, interested in that. The other influence that I mentioned before was the influence of the happening. And this is more important in a way for the series Walking Woman. Uh, you remember I, I, sh I quote just before a uh, uh, some words by Snow in which he says, echoing of artists working in happening and environments, and this in, in brackets, the ideas having never seen same. Uh, so uh, at what he allude, in fact, it is at works like the one you see it, which is done by Helen Kaprov. And Kaprov called this thing yard. You know, and indeed, it's what it is. It's a series of uh, tires like that in which he asked the public to walk. And uh, of course, everybody fell and things like that. And this is, uh, it's, let's say, first an environment, and it ends up as an happening. Uh, here you go, and you have a lot of fun. And, uh, and uh, he have done it uh, quite early in 57. Then it have been repeated in different contexts. This one, uh, the photo was taken in the Biennale of Sydney in Australia in 1990. So it's one of the repetition of this uh, project that uh, I've been photographed here. But, but you see what's happening here in a way. It is the idea that you could take uh, things from the street almost and create a kind of uh, artificial milieu in which uh, art is not something that you look at, uh, detached like in the museum, but in which you participate yourself and uh, you create an environment who becomes suddenly uh, an happening, if you want. Kaprov was uh, already in the middle of the 50s pushing this type of art and calling it happening or environment. And he was also his theoretician, if you want. He, was, he wrote about it a lot and things like that. Another artist that uh, could have been also, uh, uh, some ideas of, of this artist could have been also reach uh, snow. But again, like he says, we didn't see these things, but we heard of them. Huh? We, and that's uh, the way they, influ they got influenced by the idea more than by the, the actual fact. Is uh, Klaus, Klaus uh, Oldenburg. Huh? You see him here on the right uh, in the middle of a, what seems to be a total mess, but this is his studio. Uh, that have been transformed in store. And he called it this kind of uh, environment, he called it the store. Uh, uh, he had a studio near Orchard Street in New York, and there was a lot of these stores that were selling a lot of things. And he decided to, to do it with, a, with his own work. What you see suspended in midair are papier mache uh, version of uh, hamburgers, uh, uh, ice cream cone, uh, and also a tie and a shirt and things like that. And since it's a store, it was open for two, two months, let's say in 62, people could come and buy an uh, Oldenburg like this, uh, I want a tie and uh, buy, buy Oldenburg and all that. And he made also at a certain point even store days where you, you had the real happening there you were with actors and things like that, people uh, making fun or, sh or shouting and all that. From time to time he have store days like this huh? in, inside of that. He said himself that for him it was a, per a perfect uh, uh, situation halfway between art and life, is some came in and said, 
this is not art, it's an hamburger. Uh, and others come and say, this is not an hamburger, this is art. Uh, so he says that this kind of blurring between the two situations was interesting for him, and that's uh, why he did it. Okay, so with this context, with this idea of the happening, well, a little bit like Snow could, could uh, grasp it from Toronto at the time, came the idea of the walking woman, because you will see it's basically this type of problem that they are asking. Are they art in real life, or are they real life coming to art? So this kind of confusion between the two worlds will interest immensely uh, Michael Snow. Uh, so I start with one work, we call uh, a little bit uh, pompously Venus Simultaneus. Uh, he gave a Latin uh, title to it, 1962. And uh, it's a little bit difficult to read, so that I thought I would show you a, a picture of the same, uh, the same work, maybe that would make you feel maybe a little bit more. I'm not sure if one is more clear than the other, that in this uh, rather big uh, painting, and it's like uh, two meter long, uh, no, three meter long and two meter high, uh, so it's really a kind of a, a huge piece. You have some of these walking women are painted on the ground, others are collage, and others are detached and project some shadow. Uh, so you have to imagine that you have different stage of these walking women, they are sometimes just drawn on the surface, sometimes slightly detached, like in a collage, and then suddenly almost uh, getting away from, from, the, from the place. Uh, why he called it simultaneous, he says that uh, she's a, the, the walking woman should be everywhere the same, and she will be also, let's say, in different time and different place, always the same, but also being able to be at the same time everywhere. Uh, that's more or less what the, uh, the simultaneity that he wanted to suggest, let's say, uh, a sign of permanence of form and a kind of ubiquity also of the form, that you can find it everywhere, but it's always the same form that is uh, repeated and repeated all the time. Why to use a Latin t title? I always thought that, I'm not sure of that, but uh, uh, we should ask it to, to Michael Snow before he died. I, I always thought that he wanted to make a kind of feminine pendant to a famous Barnett Newman painting, uh, wh which I show you on the right, and which is called also in Latin, Vir Heroicus Sublimis, uh, meaning something like uh, a sublime and heroic man, a man in the masculine form. And of okay, the, the walking, the Venus Simultaneus will be like uh, the Barnett Newman painting, but it would be a kind of feminine version of it, if you want. Uh, in, in the painting of uh, Newman, you have uh, what he himself called the zip, uh, this kind of line there, it's a vertical line that uh, will uh, divide, let's say, the surface. You have even another one there who is darker and create a kind of square here in the middle of this huge painting also. It's about this, the same size, both painting. And for him, this zip is like man. It's like man detaching himself from the background, which is the, the big red surface that you see there. So you could say that Snow do that a little bit, the same thing, but with a figure, with a figure detach itself also and affirm itself in front of the background. But on the other hand, the ambiguity of the color here is such that it's difficult to make the distinction between what is real and what is uh, uh, fictive, what is really a form and what is really background and what is dream, illusion, or reality. Uh, you create this kind of ambiguity that we don't have in the Barnett Newman where uh, clearly uh, we have this zip that affirms itself in front of the void uh, behind him. Uh. So maybe it was, uh, it was uh, one of the idea of, uh, of Snow to, to make a kind of a feminine pardon to, uh, to the painting of, uh, of Newman. In fact, what the critics have said at the time, and especially uh, New York critic, it is they have seen a relationship between Snow work, uh, Snow's work with pop art. Uh, 
for them, that was much more evident uh, than uh, relation with, with Barnett uh, Newman. Uh, uh, especially, for instance, Lucy uh, Lippard, who's a, who's a very important critic, says that Snow is the Canada best known tangential tangential pop artist. Well, this is nice to say tangential because it doesn't make you completely in the movement, make you a little bit on the side, but nevertheless, uh, she saw him as a pop artist. Snow refused that. Huh? And he make a, a reasoning, let's say, with dates, like, like a real art historian, you know, that we should be clear on when do we have been exposed to pop art in Toronto, and when did I make my first <laughs> walking woman? So the reasoning goes like this, as I'm quoting Snow. It was perhaps within a year before the first notice of what Warhol and Liechtenstein were doing. The main influence with Trigger, it was partly knowing about Oldenburg and Kaprov, so the two uh, uh, happening people that I showed you just before. Huh? He, he says the real influence is not the pop art. It is these people that were making happening and environment. I hadn't experienced their work, but hearing about it triggers some problem in my work, which I'm been approaching. Uh, the, uh, and the fact that the, uh, uh, let's see, if we, if we ask then the question, okay, that's, uh, that's very nice, but when do we see pop art in Toronto at the time. Well, the first exhibition was called the, uh, um, not a very, uh, very interesting title, The Heart of Things. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm not <laughs> it's not a good title for pop art. Pop art is about image, uh, it's not about things. And uh, so the, anyway, it was called that way, and it was presented at the Gerald Morris International Gallery from 19 October, 6 November, 1962. Uh, 63, pardon me, 62, all the reasoning for. So few months and many months after uh, Snow claimed to have done his first uh, uh, walking woman, uh, as if the, already in terms of dates, if you want, he precede uh, the, this influence of the puppy. I have not seen them yet, and it's, uh, uh, we should not uh, try to find their source. But there's another reason I think is more interesting and more important. Because, as you, as you know, the pop artists have taken manifestation of low heart, uh, like for instance, a uh, picture of uh, Marlon Monroe by Warhol here on the, on the left side, or any um, kind of romance uh, comics you see that you can find uh, in, in, uh, in any stores that Lichtenstein have used. Uh, to make here this drowning girls. I don't remember what she said, but something, whatever you think, Brad, I'm drowning, I don't want to hear of you, and something. As if it's really come from these uh, type of comics of uh, what's called romance. Uh, and uh, so they take two manifestation of what we could call low art uh, and bring them to the high level of high heart. Uh, as if now these, these pictures are uh, in this case, uh, in the possession of Leo Castelli, who is one of the most uh, famous uh, heart merchants of New York, and the other is in the museum. Uh, it's, uh, it's at the, uh, I think it's the MoMA, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Anyway, and the, the let's see, the, the final, uh, uh, the, uh, the, these paintings finish finally in museum, in art gallery, and in, in great collection. So you have a movement from, let's say, popular heart, which we can call low heart, toward high heart. In the case of Snow, if you think of it, he didn't take for his walking woman any image pre-existing to him. Yeah. He invented it. He created his own motif. It's not a motif copied from something that already exists that will have brought somewhere else, but it was already there. And you could say, well, one of the aim of pop art was to, like they used to say, to reduce the gap between art and life. Huh? That was their idea, to, to take things with in life in a way that is in the surrounding of everybody and to bring it toward art, but so to reduce the gap between both. Huh? Uh, this, for instance, also can be illustrated with, Rauch with Rauschenberg uh, work, like you see here on the left. It is the, the quilt that he used on his own bed, and he called the word bed, so there's no ambiguity here. 
And uh, this is uh, uh, with some piece of, uh, there was some uh, uh, spot of paint on it and that was it, it was put vertically on the wall. And the other work is in Stockholm uh, in a museum also, it's called Monogram and it uh, consists in a real uh, goat, uh, well a stuffed animal, so it's not living and with a, t a real tire around and a lot of object here. And uh, so you could say, again, the, the, the idea of being, being this is to bring almost part of life, like his, the quilt on his bed, to in uh, uh, a collection, let's see here in Leo Castelli, and or in a museum like in the Monogram. Uh, you understand this kind of process that you have there. In the case of snow, you could say that uh, you have almost a reverse type of things. Uh. He start from his own picture, he create a form, and then he will, he start from art, and then he will bring it toward life, I would say. And this he will do in many ways. He will, for instance, uh, use the pattern of the, of the walking woman in different contexts. Much before Keith hiring, he made poster in the metro with it, with a subway in, in Toronto. Uh, he, uh, he put it also on, on any post, uh, uh, telephone post that he could find around his place. Uh, he made a book, uh, how do you call it? Uh, les signettes, a book uh, mark well, th that you put in a book to know your place. So little, he made postcard with it. Uh, and uh, meaning that if we can detach uh, from our background the walking woman, we could maybe bring her in different type of circumstances. So the, the movement, if you want, is from heart toward life and not the opposite way again, not from life toward heart. Uh, if you want, it's high heart going to low heart. Uh, he went as far as to put the walking woman on the door of a taxi driver. Uh, so for, for the taxi driver, every, his work was uh, going all over Toronto that way. That's a good idea. Uh, you, a little bit like the graffiti artists in New York who put their work on the, the, uh, the, the real uh, the wagon of the metro. You know, this is fantastic. You see, you have your work coming and going all over New York all day uh, and seen by millions of people. And you, you just have to paint them on the, on the, the cars themselves. So, th and it was done, of course, it was stopped in this thing because people were not too happy to see that every morning. <laughs> but uh, let's say it, it's a little bit the same idea. Uh, and he did more than that. He, he, uh, I will show you a work that is inspired by this idea of bringing heart toward life, in a way, in this uh, series of photo. Oh, it's called Four to Five, uh, and uh, dated the June 1962. So what he did, if you look carefully, you will see the walking woman is ear, is ear. You see one ear, and he, you see, uh, and he bring it in real environment. Let's say, for instance, in front of a store, or at the uh, at the door of a subway, or at a crossroad. Uh, and four to five, it is the time of the day uh, where he, he did that. Uh, meaning that this is the time, of course, where most of people have only one idea, it's to go home and to, uh, to uh, it's the, the time where they leave the office and are on their way to home. And he put these, uh, these uh, sculpture, if you want, that you see here and there, and photograph the people, how they react to it. Uh, and of course, most of them doesn't seem to pay even attention, if you look carefully. You will see these themes. Even here, you have one who wait on the corner of the street uh, like everybody else, and, and nobody looks at it, and just look at the, at the light, of course, uh, a traffic light to know when, when to cross the street. If the, so in a way, you, you have a kind of limit here in which the work of art is so much immersed in the crowd and in, in life that it disappears almost, uh, as if the, the uh, the démarche of uh, the pop artist will be the exactly the opposite. We take something in the real life and we bring it in such a way in the, uh, the, the context of a museum that you cannot n no more uh, not see it and not pay attention to it. Uh, you understand that it is like uh, um, uh, uh, opposite way or reverse way to ask the, the problem. We, we could always say is that uh, 
Who cares, you see, if you do it from one direction or the other? But the fact is that the pop art is always did in the same direction, always to toward art and never in the other way around. Huh? Even uh, say a, a musician like John Cage, for instance, uh, in a piece that I, I like anyway because it's, it's fun to hear, it's called Fontana Mix, in which what he did, he, he put microphone outside of a concert hall and got all the noises of the street and bring them in the concert hall. Um, all. But he didn't do the, the opposite. Right? He didn't do uh, music in the concert that will be spread out in, on the street. Uh, and I, again, it's always the same, the, the same type of dilemma. Uh, the, uh, the other problem I think that Snow understood and will bring him even m further in this type of consideration, it is the problem that have uh, also fascinated Marcel Duchamp. And it is the, what is making exactly the limit between art and non-art? Uh, when do we, t we think that a piece become non-artistic? Uh, and you know how Duchamp did, the, did the, its demonstration uh, with his famous urinal. I don't know if you remember a little bit the circumstances in which it was, it was done. I will just summarize it briefly. Marcel Duchamp was at the time in the States in 1916, and uh, he managed to be quite uh, well seen and known in, in, during the period where he was there. He was friend with uh, famous collector Walt Arensberg, and Arensberg was also uh, a good publicist for Duchamp. So at a certain point, the American Association of Artists decided to make a show, and Duchamp succeeded to be invited there and to be in the committee of organization, okay? Then he proposed two rules. And he says, we are in the States here, this is a democratic country, I propose that we will have an exhibition without jury. Everybody applaud, good idea, Monsieur Duchamp, this is fantastic, no jury. Okay, he says, it's very simple, he says, you, you charge a fee to the artist, $5, and you give him a place in, in the exhibition. He must uh, give his name, uh, the title of his piece, and uh, the five dollar. Très bien, perfect, there's no problem with that. Second thing, we will not make hierarchy between people. We will just put their name in a hat and we will pull them like this. So they did that and the first letter was the R. So in the first room, you have all the artists, what's called Ronald, Rice, uh, uh, whatever. They uh, started with R. Okay, these two rules were, were set, set up. By Duchamp, in a way, uh, being on the committee of organization. So Duchamp sent this thing to the American Artists Association. So, and he paid a $5, and he says, it is by Armut, right? it's signed, and 19, uh, 1917. He called it Fountain, and of course, uh, ladies, bear with me, but this is, a, this is what you find in a men's room. Uh, it's a urinal. Right? And uh, right away, the organizer, of the show said, ah, somebody wants to make a joke on us. He said, we cannot accept that. And uh, during the vernissage, during the opening, they hide it. Uh, it was not seen. Then Duchamp got some journalists and uh, he told them, this association is not completely democratic, you know. He says, one guy, Monsieur Hermut, sent a piece, which is called Fountain, and instead of following the rules that were accepted by everybody, they didn't show it at the vernissage. Oh, the journalists said, well, this is fantastic, it's a scandal, and it begins to write articles. And then nobody has seen the work yet. Huh? And then the article become to multiply it and all that, and then suddenly uh, Duchamp asked Stieglitz, who is one of the great photographers of the time, to take a photo of the urinal and to make it circulate. But then he associated the, the journalist saw for the first time what was the fountain. I didn't know too much what to do of it, and some, some of them had the bri brilliant idea to find aesthetic merit to it. One compared it to a Buddha shape, you know, another to a Madonna, and things like that, and the things went on and on and on like this, and so much that the literature on the fountain of Duchamp is probably big like this. You have books written about it. Not a single department of art history does have not only one, but at least two or three slides of this thing everywhere in the world, okay? 
What did Duchamp demonstrate there? Uh, I think uh, uh, there was a serious problem there. It is the problem of the, uh, this limit between art and non-art. Uh, and what decides the limit, really, of art and non-art? Uh, is it the artist? Is it the curator? Is it the people, the journalists? Is it the art historian? So he implied all these people and show you that, in fact, a work of art is something who has been created by an artist and then take over by a whole context in which suddenly anything could become a, 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 an objet d'art. Uh, but the, the great thing there, I think it is that, uh, like uh, Duchamp used to say, I'm fed up of this proverb, bad comme un peintre, uh, stupid like a painter. He says, what I have wanted to do is to control the whole process, to be uh, in such a way that I know how the system works, to bring the, the piece at the right moment and to create uh, the whole, uh, uh, let's say, uh, the, the whole display of, uh, of uh, interest ar around the world. Huh? So what was the problem then? It was really the, the distinction between uh, what is art and what is non-art. Huh? And the role that, let's say, the display of the work plays in the definition of a work of art as art. Huh? If I take these this glasses and I put them on a little pedestal in the Musée d'Art Contemporain, and I put below François Gagnon, Lunette uh, de je sais pas qui, whatever, and then 2004, uh, and then uh, three centimeters that with, uh, say I make a little label, will it become a work of art? Uh? Where is the limit where uh, the, the very display in which it's, uh, the context in which it's represented will suddenly make at least people hesitate if en plus uh, my friends write articles about this and, and, and it's published and I have a slide made and, it's, uh, and I, I use it in every lecture that I give, well, that's it. It, 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 it may become a work of art. Huh? So what Duchamp felt also, he said, we cannot do that endlessly with everything. It has to be <laughs> spaced, you know, otherwise, two things. If everything becomes art, nothing is art. But if you maintain always this kind of uh, hard line like this at the limit of, uh, of art and non-art, you could go on like this for a while. And this is exactly what he did with the ready-mades. Uh, and in fact, you could say that Snow did something of that kind by bringing his walking woman in the public, but on the reverse way. Uh, mind you, Duchamp have thought of this also. He says once, we should be able to use a Rembrandt as an ironing board. Yeah. Uh, he, he never did it, of course. <laughs> but, uh, but you see, then it's the opposite also of that. The, the closest thing that he did of that kind was to use a reproduction of the Mona Lisa and to add a little pinch, uh, a little mustache, and a little goatee to, to it. And he, he did also something that I find cute. Uh, he called this one the Mona Lisa shaved because he didn't put any uh, of this uh, little thing here. <laughs> she's like it is, so she's shaved now. Uh, one was done uh, early, and he, well, he called it with a kind of uh, uh, bad taste pun in French uh, look, but uh, if you pronounce this in French, L-H-O-O-Q, uh, which is not nice, I will not translate. <laughs> she's hot somewhere, I will not tell you where. and. Uh, so that was maybe the, f the further Duchamp went in that direction, let's say, to, he is also dealing with, of course, with the idea of masterpiece. In the case of Snow, what happened, that if Snow uses his own image, he can do whatever he wants with it. He, he doesn't have the kind of hang up that Duchamp himself had with masterpiece. And he didn't really use a Rembrandt as an ironing board. Uh, it would have been a, a, a terrible thing. He said it, he kept it as a concept, if you want, a kind of conceptual work of art, but never really produced. In the case of Snow, since he is the author of the image, he could decide to do whatever he wants with it. Uh, and, uh, and he's not dealing with uh, the idea of a masterpiece. I think, in fact, he's closer to uh, a preoccupation like Donald Judd had, for instance. Donald Judd uh, called these things habitually, he, he doesn't give them any names. Uh, they look like 
about human size, you see your head would just go a little bit above this, they look like boxes. Huh? And then again, what is the difference between a box and a work of art? What is the, the exact uh, limit where it's just a box and it's not interesting and then become, in the contrary, a work of art? This is, uh, to my mind, is a, a little bit closer to what, uh, uh, to what uh, uh, Snow wanted to do. Huh? Uh, wh what Snow does, in a way, by using his own work, he could put them in every context he wanted, he, he could destroy them, he could use them as an iron board if he wants, uh, there was no, no problem, and he excludes this idea of challenging masterpieces, making scandal with, with the idea, and because, anyway, the scandal always worn out fast, uh, and I think it was a better strategy uh, from, uh, from the part uh, of Snow. Okay, I want, sh I want to show you now a few others, example of his uh, uh, series of The Walking Woman by uh, Michael Snow. Like this one is called Bikini. Well, the, the title is quite obvious with the, with the subject. It's 1963, and it represents the same lady, let's say, the same walking woman in different attire, uh, al also uh, in black and white, bizarre, uh, uh, as if she was seen in x-ray and then with a dress and then with this kind of uh, little bathing suit. Uh, then he, I think wha what is interesting about uh, wha what is happening in, in this type of painting in snow, it is this idea that the real subject of snow is not really the woman. And on this he was very clear. He said, my subject is not woman or a woman, but the first cutboard cutout of walking woman I made. Ah, this is interesting. That means what I'm representing here, it's not a woman, it is an image of a woman. Huh? The point de part, if you're on the point of departure of the series, is rather an image and not uh, the subject matter is such. A second removed depiction, he called it. Huh? Second removed depiction. It's a depiction, but of a picture. Uh, and not uh, of the real thing. Always use its same size as original, five feet tall, walking woman is not an idea, it's just a drawing, not a very good one either, he says. I don't believe in the representation, but we really look at and say it's a woman passing through. It's material, a representation too. It's any realer, we must believe that it is. My subject is the same in the 59 and 60 abstract painting and sculpture, but now it tacked, uh, but now I can put it in real context and it will have a certain action on the people who will look at it or will not look at it or will ignore it or will react to it in different type of circumstances. Uh, so, you, so I think this is illustrated here also, the fact that with this repetition you feel that, okay, we are not dealing, we are dealing almost like a, a commercial brand, say a mark, uh, as if you were repeating the same picture to say, okay, this is Michael Snow work, uh, and this is, uh, uh, you, you, you see it a little bit like this also, like a kind of, uh, of uh, uh, brand name, like, like a mark, you know, like a commercial mark. Huh? Another variation of the same thing is here, where he called it Encyclopedia, 1964-65, uh, January 65, uh, in which uh, the same image have been repeated uh, endlessly, and then when he, all this was finished, all these walking women, one above the other was finished, he began to fill the gap, I would say. Sometimes he, 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 uh, he put some black in the picture, but sometimes in between the picture, and obtained, of course, an encyclopedia of variation and form uh, that way. Huh? You understand that one of, uh, certainly, one of the challenges of this series, it is the repetition and how to renew it. Huh? You, you could repeat a form endlessly, but how to renew it? In a way, it is, for instance, to have a new attitude toward what is form and what is background. So the background suddenly becomes the form. And of course, it's bizarre, it's different. It could be uh, suddenly completely blacked out, or he will see connection from the top to the bottom. He will get like this every combination possible, and he call it uh, uh, kind of uh, encyclopedia. And uh, I could quote again some notes of his uh, uh, near misses, uh, a lot of near misses. He says, repetition, trademark, my trade, my mark, uh, mock mass production, uh, as if it was mass production, but uh, with irony. 
art the only cottage industry left. Huh? Art is the only cottage industry left huh? in that sense. Uh, you will find the same type of problematic in this huge painting. It is called Clothed Woman. And in bracket, you call it in memory of, of my father because it was the finish uh, when he heard of the death of his father. Huh? And uh, you have, again, uh, the, the form more or less uh, clear the ear, for instance, a little bit more. But there's so many uh, in between uh, form that have been filled out with other colors and all that, that the, the very image become difficult to read. Huh? Uh, I think I've read, but this has to be checked, that his father was blind. And uh, so there is also this idea of a kind of deterioration of the image. Uh, if you become blind, you become to see, uh, to blur the distinction between uh, what is form and what is uh, background. Uh, uh, anyway, Clothed Woman was also presented at the Expo of 67. Uh, you remember I showed it in the beginning. Uh, there were the stairs and you see it on the top. It's a huge picture. Uh, it's a, and also uh, I think it was convenient to call it in memory of my father since uh, it was an important picture and he, he just heard about uh, his death. Uh, another example. Five girls panel of 1964, uh, where you see uh, the girl transform like that uh, in different shapes. She could be very thin or very fat, uh, depend uh, as if she is exactly in the shape that the uh, the, the frame uh, suggests. If you want, if she's on a square, she should be fat. If she's on a elongated uh, rectangle, she could be uh, more thin and all that. So five girls panel like that. At the time, the critics speak of the LSD uh, influence. And it's true that if you take drugs, you will see things a little bit transform, a little bit like in a, uh, in a hall of mirrors also. Uh, I had uh, another idea. Again, this is a completely uh, uh, gratuitous in a way. There is the possibility of transforming a shape if you play with the grid on which you represent, let's say, an animal, li like here. You, uh, you have a fish, it's the same fish who looks very different if you change uh, the grid or the orientation of it. Uh, uh, these uh, drawings were done by a man called Darcy Thompson, who had nothing to do with art. He's a, he's a mathematician, a scientist, and he was an anti-Darwinian uh, scientist. Uh, he published his book of growth and form in 1917, a little bit against the, uh, the theory of evolution of uh, Darwin, because he says all the form of life could be deduced from one from the other uh, with a mathematical grid. And for instance, uh, I could give you another example of his drawing in which, again, the same fish here was down, uh, become completely different if you change the, the grid, if you change the, the orientation of the grid. A little bit like what Snow did with his uh, uh, five panels, you see, transforming the, the form. Maybe behind this also there is this idea of a grid, uh, which is important, as you know, to create this impression of flatness of the picture. Uh, if you have a grid, that means every little square of it are more or less equal. Uh, they, they, you cannot say, well, this one is more important than the other one. And uh, so it creates a kind of bidimensionality to the picture and affirm in certain way the surface. Uh, uh, in, uh, in this work also, you have a preoccupation of that time. You see, you see again, the, it's called duet, uh, because you have two, two representations. I don't know, it's not very clear downstairs there, but let's say this one on the top uh, represents one of his uh, walking women. She's a little bit tr uh, trim, let's say, or cropped by the, uh, the little frame around her. And you see on the head is disappearing, and the, the hands also, and the feet are also cut. And in, in the bottom part, you have the same drawing, but accompanied with lines who correspond to proportion of the human body. A, a little bit like uh, you will find this, let's say, in drawings by Durer, for instance, or Leonardo da Vinci, uh, this idea of being able to represent the exact proportion of the human body. And I introduced this parallel because, in a way, also, one of the preoccupations of Snow, it's a dialogue with tradition. Yeah? Uh, he, he used, in fact, his uh, walking woman in many guise and many style as if 
Style is not like we used to say, something that you could uh, that uh, you cannot control. That is you in a way. Uh? Style becomes the things that you could play with, uh? and then it will open the possibility for Snow to have a dialogue like this with many other painting, many other period also, and eventually uh, with the tradition, like with Durer here or, or with or with Leonardo. Uh? Look, for instance, if here in this, uh, uh, in this uh, painting, it's called Mixed Feelings uh, of 1965, if you don't have a good example of that in which the same picture is treated in, in different styles. See? You could have it here in chiaroscuro. You could have it here almost like a modern paint, uh, a kind of a almost Molinari style painting. And see, you could have the same uh, form used in many, many uh, different guys. A and this, I think, it's interesting because it put in question this whole idea that the, le style c'est l'homme, uh, meaning that you cannot control your style. It is you. Uh. And then, in the contrary, you will have artists like, well, Snow is one. You have Richler. You have others also that have done this, in which the artists take complete distance with this notion and control the style. Could, could do whatever style he wants. Huh? And maybe this comes with, of course, the development of uh, uh, art history and the, uh, the more kind of reflexive attitude we have toward art today. But uh, anyway, it, it's certainly one of the potentiality that uh, 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 Snow wanted to, to exploit. Huh? Uh, this is one of the rare pieces where he used a real personage, somebody that could be recognized. It's called Carla Blay, uh, and it was done in June 1965. So what it is, it is you have, in fact, a kind of cutout of the walking woman, and behind it, you have a photo of a real person. Carla Blay, as maybe some of you knows, it is uh, a jazz pianist. Uh, she is the ex-wife of Paul Blay, who was a uh, jazz uh, composer also of, of Montreal. And uh, as you know that S uh, Michael Snow was a, is a jazz player, always played jazz all his life, and was very interested in that. So maybe it's a kind of homage to this uh, lady who is a, a composer and a pianist also of jazz. Rather difficult, uh, let's say really contemporary uh, jazz. And she is uh, also, in a way, um, creating a kind of gap between reality and art. Huh? Because if you move a little bit in front of it, you will see that, in, in, in fact, it's a little bit like in his film, uh, where you see, at a certain point, a woman coming in the negative shape that you have in the beginning and co coinciding exactly with this hole, uh, if you want. As if the reality becomes the, uh, some uh, suddenly part of, of art, part of a surface. Uh, as if he was playing with that, the gap between what is real and what is just an image. Uh, uh, because, uh, let's say, uh, Snow have made many films also, and in this one is called New York High and Ear Control, and in which one of the final scenes, if I remember well, is this. You see the actress coming inside of uh, one of the uh, cutout of uh, the walking woman. Uh, and I will finish uh, this presentation. It's really just a fragment of it. Uh, you, you realize that Snow is an immense artist. And I promised myself to come back to his, <laughs> to his work. But just by taking, I thought walking woman is, is a good subject since we wanted to think about the figure in Canadian art. And the human figure, it was a subject that was imposed itself. But, and even then, even with the few examples I show you, we have only uh, just the tip of the iceberg. Huh? You have to think that for almost 10 years, he did only that. Uh, re repeating all the time the, the steam and many, many guys and many uh, contexts. This one is called Hawaii, and I think again it's a work that play with the tradition. Okay, it represents at first, um, if you want, you'll have three pictures, three different pictures. Uh, let's see what is white here is the wall. Uh, so uh, what you have on the right side, it is a kind of little still life, I would say almost like Chardin. You see, showing music and painting together, but uh, as if it was a, a very cheap comic strip uh, artist that was doing, uh, doing that. Uh, so you see a little pickup and probably a little uh, loudspeaker nearby. I thought first it was a slide projector, a slide, 
a little table to show slides, but I'm not sure. I think it's a loudspeaker. And then a b on the wall, of course, a picture of one of the head of the walking woman. And then you see her. You see the picture itself. And finally, you see it as if you were receding from the space. And this, in a way, reminds me of uh, a, f a phenomenon that we call anamorphosin. Anamorphosin, okay? What it is, it is its use in the picture of the uh, Renaissance and the early uh, Baroque era, in which, uh, for instance, in this famous Holbein picture, you have here in the bottom, I don't know if you see it, a kind of skull here. Uh, here, here. But it's so deformed and so transformed that really if you see it as it is, you have to be where I am now. Huh? If I see it that way, I see a kind of, I would see in three dimensions. If you pass in front of it, something appears to you and then disappears. Huh? So that's what it was called anamorphosin. Uh, uh, and in, in the picture of snow, you could see that the last little picture on the left is like an anamorphosis. Huh? It's like as if it become to be transformed something else that we will not be able to recognize. Huh? All by, and I don't know what was his intention, but something certainly like the opposition between these wealthy ambassadors, let's say, and deaf. Huh? You could say that that was more or less uh, uh, the idea. Uh, so then again, you see Snow dealing with tradition, dealing in a kind of original way, uh, but dealing with the, the, the whole tradition of, of painting. Uh, and always the problem has been to how to bring, how to fill the gap between art and life, or between art and non-art, uh, how, to, how to go. Because finally, this is one of the most uh, important uh, issue, let's say, of contemporary art. Uh, suppose that you, you imagine that heart is like a triangle. Uh, in the middle of it, you have sure works, uh, like, let's say, Holbein and, uh, and let's say, uh, for us, Pellerin, Picasso, uh, Picasso and Bordeaux. And, uh, these are sure works. But then you go a little bit further uh, from this uh, uh, central triangle, and you, up, you go toward a limit when, if you go too far, you are in no more in art. Uh, and this limit, in a way, you could say how contemporary artists try to push it a little bit more all the time. And the risk, of course, if you push it too much, nobody likes it or nobody sees it as art. And with time, suddenly, what was really on the margin goes in the center and is accepted. Uh, and sometimes it takes more time than the others. But this is one, certainly one of the big issues of, of uh, contemporary art and was seen first by Marcel Duchamp and was also, because of him, influential on many, many artists. Huh? And Snow is a too intelligent and too subtle artist not to have seen that. And I think his genius was really to reverse the proposition to go for in the other direction and explore uh, that way uh, all, the, all this gap between art and non-art. Okay. With this, we end the series of lecture. I was uh, very touched by your uh, faithfulness. I recognize many faces from a few years. And also, thank you for your attention. Really, you are a mar marvelous crowd.